Welcome to the Business of Pharmacy podcast, where we explore the business of pharmacy through candid, in-depth conversations with the industry's top leaders. Every Monday, tune in for insights and stories you won't find anywhere else. I'm your host, Mike Kelzer. Peter, for those that may not have come across you online, introduce yourself to our listeners. I'm Peter Axe, the founder and CEO of Upscript Health. We partner with pharma companies that want to bring medications and therapies direct to consumer. And they do that by creating a digital flow from their branded medication website to our Upscript Health platform, where a patient can see a healthcare provider online, have a telemedicine visit, can determine their insurance benefits, can get patient support, and can receive their medication shipped to them directly. And they can see those providers quickly. They can have an efficient visit with an expert on their disease state and their therapy that they're considering purchasing and get what we believe is absolutely world-class treatment. Peter, well, first of all, I got to start here. I know that you're from Arizona. You don't live there year round, but I went down there with my brother-in-law years ago and they made me go up Camelback Mountain with them. Have you been up Camelback? I've had many times. I got about probably a few hundred yards in there and then they had this like pole that you have to hold on to. And I'm used to marching around Lake Michigan by its name. It's flat. They're seashores. Yeah. And I saw that and I turned around and bugged out. I think I made it up like maybe later in that week I went up there, but that freaked me out. So I stay on the little, what do they call them, bunny hills now when I go down there. Yeah. Well, if you really want a challenge, try doing that in June or July when it's 120 degrees outside. There are deaths on Camelback Mountain pretty regularly. Well, there was one last year. Yeah. I think the guy was with his new girlfriend or something and just let her go down the mountain by herself. She ended up marching around someone's backyard, probably delirious, and then she dropped dead of heat exhaustion heat or exhaustion. something. Yeah, heat exhaustion will get to you. And look, the climb is challenging, but it's not a technical climb. You'll grab the sides of poles, like you say, they put poles in the ground to help people grip. But what happens, so my children and I, of course, I raised my children growing up climbing Camelback Mountain pretty regularly. Well, my daughter, when she finished college, decided to take me on a hike up Kilimanjaro. Oh, wow. And I'm not a lover of hikes, but it was quite an adventure. Kilimanjaro, is that you're roping yourself in with the hooks and all that kind of stuff? You're not. It's not a technical climb, but it's a brutal climb. It's 10, 12 hours a day of nonstop climbing uphill. You wow. get above the tree line eventually, very thin oxygen, and you end up in a shale area where there's a lot of sort of dust and not great footing around you, and it's a really challenging climb. All right, Peter, here's a problem, though. When I'm going up Camelback, I see these benches with, like, dedication things on them, and yeah. I do the math. This person, 1960 to 1992. Now, wait a minute. That person didn't die of cancer up here. Yeah, exactly. They, they went right over yeah. the edge. There's more benches up there than I'm comfortable with, with yeah. all those plaques on there. So, Peter, do I have that right that you founded the company, but you didn't always run the company? So, I left Wall Street in late 90s, 1999, I believe it was, maybe 2000. And I decided I would invest in a number of different companies. I'd had a pretty solid career on Wall Street. I'd been a tech investment banker. I'd done some venture capital things. I'd had some successes, and I thought, I'm going to relocate from New York to Arizona, raise my children in Arizona. And I was then going to invest in various businesses. So in 2000, I started to invest in a number of different companies. One of those investments was in an online pharmacy. In those days, it was called QuickMed, K-W-I-K-M-E-D. And we still operate the QuickMed website. It sells lifestyle medications, but it's not really our core business. It's a small fragment of our business. And so I just purchased that online pharmacy and... I wasn't really too involved for a long time. I was very much involved in the regulations and the legal aspects of it and making sure it was a legitimate business and that the cornerstone of everything we did was around proper regulatory policy because we knew we were you know, creating new ground in a lot of ways. And so I was a secondary figure in terms of running it, operating it in those days. But then about 10 plus years ago or so, 
the business really started to take shape. It, it took a while, but it took shape, and I really needed to be much more involved. So about 10 plus years ago, I became full-time CEO of the company and have been operating it since. You guys were maybe kind of a target when you're one of the first ones. You've got people looking at you and making sure everything's straight and narrow. Yep. But My then as time went on, though, then you had to take a bigger role because it was growing so fast. Right, right. And, and it was really becoming a very substantial company with a real possibility of being an earth-shattering company. And I really do think we're going to fall in the category of earth-shattering company. We're on that track. But there is no doubt in 2001, when we acquired the online pharmacy, we were absolutely a target. We were a target of every regulatory agency you could think of. The AMA was after us. Probably chain pharmacies that didn't want stuff in the mail, that kind of stuff. Well, yeah. And one of the real challenges, if you think about pharmacy boards on a state basis, who sits on their boards? Pharmacy operators. Absolutely. And the last thing they wanted was an internet pharmacy or potentially displacing their business. So we were oftentimes dealing with regulators that had something at stake against us. So it's very hard to win battles, but we ultimately, by evidence-based medicine, we won by explaining that we're going to be here for good, so you're going to have to learn to work with us, period. And that's how we approach things. And, and fortunately, in 2002, a year after owning the business, we received a license from the state of Utah to write a prescription online. And then that allowed us to take that sort of methodology into other states and gain permission to, to write a prescription online. But we had a lot of battles. You could write a prescription from someone remotely. Exactly. So the model that's used today, right? You have synchronous and asynchronous office visits for, for HCPs. Back then, we literally created that notion that you could actually write a valid prescription on the internet. We received the first license to do so by the state of Utah. Interesting. And the reason why it was the state of Utah is because when we acquired the company, they were effectively based in Utah. We moved them to Arizona, but they were based in Utah at that time. Well, back in the day, and I come from an independent pharmacy background, and back in the day, we wanted to attack mail order in Canada. Every other place you could think of, we wanted to attack. And now, with the vertical integration of the chains, and God bless our colleagues in the chain pharmacies, but they're overworked, and they don't have time for much, and they've got this overbearing corporation putting more work on them and things like that. Now the question is, especially since COVID with what we're doing here, talking face to face over the internet, if someone gave me the chance to either go talk to a chain pharmacist, again, they're overworked, not their right. fault. They're overworked right. by the pressure on them. If they gave me a chance to do that or sit face to face with a pharmacist online with no other abstractions and nobody behind me waiting and I'm afraid to say something because of HIPAA and all that yeah. kind of stuff or embarrassed. It's a more level playing field and you can argue either one. You can now argue, well, which one's better? And in different cases, different things are better. Absolutely. In every case is unique. But think about this irony. When we started, the argument consistently against online pharmacies and consistently against my business was that we were not as safe as traditional medicine. F physicians weren't that informed. How could you get, how could you be informed when you are simply writing a prescription on the internet, when you're simply collecting an answer to question sets and reviewing a file, or maybe you're having an audio conversation or a video conversation? How can that be as good as a face to face visit? Well, if you really look at the evidence, the contrary is actually true. And that's what's being proven today is that visit that we can have with you on the internet is much more significant and much more profound than many visits that are that are taking place in face-to-face -face setting. That doesn't mean we can cure every disorder and treat every disease through telemedicine, but we can certainly treat the vast majority of disorders where you really don't need a physical examination. You might need lab tests. You might need to see the person, understand who they are. You might need to have a phone call with them. You might need to just ask them a series of questions. But what happens when patients come to our platform, they're generally coming from one of our pharma partners, from a pharmaceutical manufacturer that has a specific medication. And they're interested in that medication. They come to our platform, they're speaking to a healthcare provider that's fully informed about that medication, fully up to date on all their information about that disease state, about other treatments available. 
And that physician can make a selection of what the best solution is for that patient. And that is something that really doesn't take place very easily in traditional medicine because there's so many different ailments. There's so many different medications. You go to a primary care physician for migraine headache, you might also go to them for diabetes. But they're, they're not an expert in either one. They've had a lot of experience. But we can actually put you in touch with experts on a, on a daily basis. We put our patients in touch with experts who've been trained in that disorder and that disease state. In many ways, our quality care is superior on the internet than it would be in a face-to-face -face setting. You know, it's a bell curve. Obviously, there's outliers. There's outliers that they're going to say, hey, look, Peter, we do everything you just said, but we hold their hand during it. There's always going to be an outlier there. But in general, it's every person for themselves now. If it was a free market, if you didn't have all the PBMs and stuff, well, then let the free market win and let people decide. And that's how it should be. Some people like it better. Some people don't like it better. We're not the answer for everything and everyone, but certainly that patient that might have tried to reach their provider and they can't get in for six weeks' time, or they don't know whether or not insurance is really going to cover their drug and they're going to be put on an expensive therapy, they can go to our platform and basically be provided with all that information. They can find out, is the medication going to be covered by their insurance? If so, what if, what's going to be their out-of-pocket cost? Then they can talk to a healthcare provider. Does it make sense? for me to be on this medication, and that provider might say yes or no, or we're gonna have another option for you, you suffer from migraine headaches, maybe you should try this other medication first. And so, so we can do all that, and we can do all that right away. You can get on the internet through our platform and talk to a provider, generally speaking, certainly within 24 hours, and we're even now working on some solutions where you'll be able to talk to a provider within 15 minutes almost all the time. Some arguments from a fictional listener would say, well, yeah, but look, you're calling this company that has this one drug. How much freedom do you think you have? Well, yeah, but the same person saying that might have just been on the fishing boat of the sales rep for this drug in town or was just taken out to golf or whatever. Now, I'm not sure how much of that happens anymore. I know we as a pharmacy don't see it because... We just bow down, I guess, to the formulary of these insurances, so we don't make decisions on that anymore. But I think there's still a little bit of that greasing the palm, maybe not money-wise, but I think that's out there still. And I think that's a, a fair argument to say, all right, there's no black and white. It's like, let the best person win. It's a valid concern that physicians might somehow be steered toward a type, type of therapy. And we would be naive to not think that is going to be a concern. The way we deal with that is we create no incentive, none whatsoever, for that physician or healthcare clinician to write a prescription. If they get paid whether they write a prescription or not, we do not create an incentive for them to write a particular prescription. We don't give them any kind of incentives for volume prescribing or anything. We give them incentives for quality care. That's what we do. So for example, all of our clinicians, all the visits that we have, and we have millions of visits, there's a certain percentage of them that every quarter we go through and we pull files and patient records and we determine whether or not our clinicians are providing good health care. We have it vetted by an independent provider who works with us. So that's part of our quality control program. We have a much more extensive quality control program, but at least the foundation of it is a review of files and patient records to be sure that that clinician has done the right thing by that patient. And the only way a, a clinician can be penalized is if they don't have good care, if they're not creating enough notes in the file, if they're not really interacting with the patient where they should, and so on. And so that's the qual kind of quality control that we want in healthcare. I I'm, I'm not concerned about writing more scripts. I'm not concerned about writing scripts for a particular type of drug. We just want great healthcare. And that's the culture of our entire organization. That is the fundamental tenet of everything we do at our company. Peter, walk through that with me. Let's say somebody calls and they're calling the company that has the main product for disease X. If a person were to be talking to that doctor and your drug is not the top choice, but it's going to be some other drug because it does something else, some other quality that this main drug doesn't have, 
What happens at that point? Does a doctor write for something and then say, here it is, go someplace else? How does that work out in cases where it's not the best choice? So think about this. E-prescribing is so simple. So a clinician listening to you and deciding that the drug you've come to me to talk about, not the drug I should put you on, they can simply push a button and send a different drug to a different pharmacy anywhere for fulfillment. So that happens all the time. So so let, let me make sure that I, Mike, I should probably run through our model so you understand mm-hmm. how it works. Mm-hmm. So what happens today is drug manufacturers spend a lot of money on advertising medications. And heretofore, before Upthrift Health, there really was no way to immediately get that therapy or talk to a physician about whether or not you want that therapy. So you might see an advertisement for a migraine headache drug. You might see an advertisement for inhaled insulin, a new concept that people have used insulin that's injected into your body, but now you can inhale it. But whatever the case may be, you see an advertisement, you go to that brand website, and on that website will be a button that says something like, would you like to speak to a clinician? Would you like to see if this drug is right for you? Patient will click on that button, and they'll end up on the Upscript Health platform. And on that platform, they'll have a telemedicine visit. They'll have a patient support group that sort of rallies around them, if you will, collects their insurance information, determines whether or not there's insurance coverage for the medication. We'll send that information to the clinician. The clinician will see the patient. The clinician will decide, this drug makes sense for you. Or by the way, maybe there's a generic for this drug. Maybe we should be prescribing you a generic. Or if there's not a generic, maybe there's another option for you. But, mm-hmm. but the patient is coming to, to that phys- clinician to discuss a specific therapy, and that clinician is there to answer questions about that therapy. So that clinician's been trained on that therapy, they've been trained on that disease state, they've been trained on all the various options available in the marketplace for that disease state, and the clinician makes a decision whether or not to prescribe. By the way, clinician might say, I need you to get lab tests send you out for lab tests and you'll come back and those lab tests will upload, automatically uploaded into our system and we have a relationship with lab providers. And so the physician may have a follow-up visit. Uh, and, and so what we're finding is, we're finding that we are being used in all sorts of use cases that we never expected. Mm. So for example, we might have a patient that comes to us through a branded website about an infusion drug and a drug that needs to be infu- the drug that needs to be injected into your body. And we will literally have the, the patient speak with the clinician, decide whether or not that's right for them, and then if it's right for them, send them to an infusion center. It might have otherwise taken weeks and weeks to get to see a clinician, but they can get an answer very quickly, get an appointment at an infusion center right away. We have other drugs where something has to be implanted in the patient will send you to a location to have that medication implanted. We can streamline the patient experience, make it relatively quick, give them excellent care because the provider's been informed about that medication and that therapy. And then, by the way, if the drug is in short supply, we can probably tell you if it's in short supply and our patient support team will call 10 different pharmacies that they have to determine where they can find a supply of that medication. So that's another thing that's coming up today quite a bit with drug shortage. Ultimately, what we've done is sort of taken some of the noise out of the system, the friction. We've gotten rid of some steps. We literally, in my view, we are redefining the patient experience in a really positive way for great care. It sounds to me like that when this doctor is talking to the patient, because that was sponsored by the brand, that initial inquiry, it sounds to me like we want to make sure that brand is part of the possible solutions. We don't want it to be forgotten about. Right. We at least want it to be twenty uh, percent of the solutions or something. It keeps it in the conversation, but not necessarily the end of the conversation. Yeah, we we call it the conversation starter. Th- that's how the conversation starts. The conversation can go on a lot of different paths, and the clinician and our commentary to the clinician is. We want the best care for that patient. You take that conversation wherever it needs to go. And that's really important because we're laying a lot of new groundwork here. So we're defining the sector. If we stumble, if we misprescribe, if we make mistakes, if we have our incentives misaligned, the industry won't happen. It literally won't happen. 
will shut it down. Well, and I think that's an important part to be because really it could be argued that, and I know this isn't the case, it could be argued people say, I'm calling this up, and if the doctor just takes my word for it, I might be calling up with a fungal infection, and it could be other skin cancer or something, but I'm diagnosing myself because it got advertised on the fungal infection page or poison ivy page or something. And so they're already all going down the wrong road, but that's why it's so important that the doctor has that freedom because the person may have made the wrong call to begin with. Yeah, look, a good clinician will know if there's a risk to them having a misdiagnosis. The clinician has to use judgment and say, is this the appropriate format to diagnose you? Is it not? If not, let me send you to a primary care physician. Let me send you to a specialist, but, but I can't prescribe online. There's too much risk in what it might be that you don't think it is. Now, the context is, if you think about what physicians learn in medical school, the, the, the mantra is 90% of the time, the patient will tell you what's wrong with them. Listen to the patient. It isn't something you do physical. You don't touch their knee or their heart or whatever. They're telling you what's wrong with them, and you just have to listen. But even in that context, you have to listen very carefully online and be sure that you're doing the right thing. And if there's any ambiguity, any doubt, any issue, that our clinicians will send you to your primary care physician, and we do that all the time. Right back to the primary care saying, go talk to them. You need this felt. They need to feel the surface of this or whatever. Right, right. Or maybe it's a dermatologist. Whoever the clinician might be will send you back there. And by the way, we can oftentimes help you get a faster appointment with that clinician because our clinician can, can speak the language and say, this is a little more urgent. Cut to the chase more. In the end, we want great care. It's what our model is all about, and that's who we're delivering to our patients. And we're doing it a really economic model. I don't have a phrase for it, I should, but it's basically don't let the old lady sit down and give them a place to put their purse while they're sitting down. I don't really have an office at work. I do now, but no one really knows. But if I'm going to talk to one of my sweet old ladies, I don't let them sit down and drop their purse down. Once they do that, with seven minutes talking hello and five minutes about the problem and a, a Midwest goodbye for another five minutes, people say, that's what you lose. It's like, you don't lose that. The doctors right now don't allow for that. The system doesn't allow for that anymore. That's old school. That's old school. It's a myth. It, you know, one of the urban myths. There used to be a metric, and I never checked this for a primary source, so I don't know how accurate this is, but there used to be a metric I always heard in the days when I was fighting with regulators about getting a license to prescribe online. And the metric I heard is that a, in an HMO environment, a physician speaks to a patient for 18 seconds. 18 seconds of real substantive conversation. And that is not a care model that made any sense at all. So, by the way, the foundings of our company were really, one of the reasons why I bought the online pharmacy in 2001 is I read the National Institute of Health put out a book called Crossing the Quality Chasm. And it predicted what was going to happen with care. And some of the fundamental tenets were about bringing care to the patient making it accessible, making it affordable, making it focused. And so th this that book became almost like a Bible for us deciding to purchase this online pharmacy and try and drive a business that would deliver care online. Someone just told me recently, like, they were at their doctor's office and they brought up, because you would think that in person and the old thought of the doctors know all your conditions and they see the uh, interactions of those and they know your hip's not bad, it's because your neck's bad and that's thrown out your back and that's thrown off your hip, that kind of stuff. But nowadays you go there and it's like you've got your one thing and you say, hey doc, as you're running out the door, I've got this going on too. The anecdote this person told me, they're like, well, set up an appointment for it. It's like, well, I'm just here right now. And I guess maybe in the yearly physical that doesn't happen, but typically now you're going to the doctor even in person for one issue. For an incident. And by the way, a, a number of the ailments we treat, if you suffer from migraine headaches, you know you suffer from migraine headaches. You've been treated for migraine headaches. You just want to try a new drug that's out. You just want to know if Ubrelvi is right for you. You just want to know if Nurtec is right for you. You want to know if Amavig, Amgen's injectable is right for you. 
And so you can have that dialogue with a clinician really easily. It's transaction focused and that's okay. We're not saying your entire healthcare plan should be evol revolving around that model, but that can help you. So for example, we treat sickle cell anemia. How can we possibly treat sickle cell anemia? Well, sickle cell anemia patient understands they have sickle cell anemia. There's a drug on the market by a company called Emmaus and it's a sickle cell anemia drug and a patient wants to talk to a clinician, they can't get into their clinician for six, eight, 10 weeks. And they, they want to talk to a clinician and say, I've heard about Emmaus, I saw an advertisement, I want to try this drug, does this make sense for me? And they can have an intelligent, informed dialogue with a clinician. That's the essence of our model. And I picked about the most difficult one in my example about the skin, but in general, you go through most of those on there, most of them are pretty, pretty straight about like a migraine. It's not as abstract as just something's happening to my skin. And by the way, those dermatologists make a hell of a lot of money, Peter. It is. Yeah. Those guys make a crap load of money, almost more than any other specialty. It must yeah. be tough. And it's hotly demanded. And there's a reason why you need to see your dermatologist. However, there's a lot of skin ailments we can treat. We really can. And technology with imaging is getting better and better. You can take a photo with your iPhone. It's going to be as good as an image used five, 10 years ago in the dermatology world. But you can get a really crisp image and see whether or not some mole is cancerous. You can definitely get that view. So I do think you'll see more and more use cases for our model. We're also testing for esophageal cancer. Well, how can we test for esophageal cancer? You'll go on and talk to a clinician if you're at high risk for esophageal cancer. For example, if you were a firefighter for more than 10 years, you have a pretty high level of probability you may have esophageal cancer someday. We can give you a test. We send you to a testing center. It takes about two minutes. They put something down your throat. They take it out. We'll give you a report online. And it's been seamless. And we find out if you're high risk by asking you some questions. If you're high risk, we have that test done. Peter, my listeners still, mainly pharmacists or pharmacy industry, they're saying, all right, well, we're listening, but we haven't touched the pharmacist part of this yet. Where do the pharmacists fit into this? Yeah. And what would your best argument be to say how pharmacists are being used in a really good way? Yeah. So, so it's important to recognize that today, nine times out of 10, when we have a patient support phone call and the patient needs information... They don't want to talk to the HCP. They want to talk to the pharmacist because they want to talk about how the medication is impacting them, or they have questions about side effects, or they have questions about dosage, or they have questions about when they should refill and if they should extend out the remedy. Most of the time, our pharmacists are front and center with our patients having conversations about care. And that's a really new phenomenon. But I think it's consistent with the phenomenon that pharmacological solutions have really become the focus of healthcare today. If you think about what's happening, people are not on just one or two meds these days. People are on three, four, and five meds. If you age, you might be on 10 and 15 meds. So there's really complicated pharmacology going on these days, and people have to understand side effects. They have to understand drug interaction. So there's a big role for our pharmacists, big role. And it's a very important part of our offering. In our model, most of the time, we don't fulfill the drug because branded drugs require insurance adjudication. Our pharmacy does not work with branded adjudicated drugs. We are cash pay pharmacy solely. So we usually team up with whether it's Amazon or 20 other hub companies or specialty pharmacy companies, whoever the manufacturer wants us to work with, we work with. But what we find is the questions that are always being asked are really related to pharmacy. And pharmacy is playing a bigger and bigger role in everything we do. Interesting where we match up, Peter, is our little pharmacy about three years ago. I don't think there's a whole lot like us in the nation, but we stopped doing brand name medicines because we were ordering $10,000 a night in brand name medicine and we're getting paid $9,000 a month later. So right. maybe someday they'll call me uh, a wise man and I'll humbly get up there and say, well, I'm not that wise. We were going to go out of business if I continue to do this path. So in essence, it wasn't a choice for us. It was a choice to either lock the door or have a yeah. different model. And I wish it wasn't that way, but we're still around at least to bitch about it where maybe yeah. I wouldn't have before if I had to keep doing that. Well, you've done a number of podcasts on 
PBMs. And we know it's just a, it's a broken model. It's a misaligned model with healthcare and it needs to be readjusted. But you think about it, PBMs control reimbursement, absolutely control it. They have no incentive to provide good reimbursement to a mail order pharmacy, for example, because they would compete directly with the PBM. Then add to it the independent pharmacy, what's their real incentive to give you good reimbursement? None. So they're going to squeeze everything they possibly can. And if you don't want to handle branded drugs, the next guy will handle, handle branded drug. They don't care. So, so the PBM model is a problem and it needs to be fixed. And there's a lot of scrutiny on it now. A lot of eyes looking at what, what's been happening in the PBM world. I don't know that it'll change so quickly, but because these are very powerful companies. But there was a Harvard Business School case written last year about Upscript Health, about our business. And it really extends through our whole entire history, regulatory history. It talks about a pivot that I made in the business, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. But it talks about ultimately, if you think about Upscript Health and where we could go eventually, we could disintermediate the PBM. We could work directly with manufacturers, get pricing directly from manufacturers at a very good price, negotiate with payers, assuming payers are independent of PBMs, which they're not today, but assuming they were, and you don't need a PBM world. You can get a best possible price from the manufacturer, which is probably 50% off of their WAC price, and have a cash pay component and a payer component. I've oversimplified things, obviously, but the Harvard Business School case goes through this entire model of, of what could potentially happen if Upscript Health you know, goes is as successful as we think it'll be. So l let me talk a little bit about the pivot we made. So about six years ago, we had the original online business that I bought in 2001, the online pharmacy. And that was basically focused on selling largely generic medications at a profit. And good business, solid business. But about six years ago or so, companies like Hims and Roman and others got lots of venture capital funding, were willing to generate tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in losses and acquire customers. And we thought to ourselves, the generics business is a business that's a race to a zero gross margin. So we said, let's pivot from that business and let's really focus on our pharma partnership, we know, which we know we're working, but it was in very small scale in those days, six years ago, we only had a few partnerships. They were working for sure, but, but they were small. And so we said, let's really focus our efforts on these pharma partnerships. Well, lo and behold, it's really worked. There's a lot of demand from pharma. We did seven partnerships in 2022. We did 17 in 23. We're going to finish 24 and over 30 partnerships, and we're probably going to do 60 partnerships next year. So we're doubling in size every single year with our pharma partnerships. The business is exploding. It was the right decision. And by the way, we have a good relationship with our pharma clients, and they really won't leave us as long as we're providing great service and great care to their patients. Pharma companies get to be closer to their patients, which is a big win for them and for the patient. And we get to report on things like shortages. We get to report on things like adverse events. We can provide a lot of good, solid information to our partners as well. So we pivoted the business about six years ago. That's what the Harvard Business School case was written about. And then the secondary piece of that is what could happen to the PBM world if we continue to succeed. The ones you mentioned, the hymns and things like that, they don't really associate themselves with a brand that they're more like a generic and different different odds and ends, but not right. really selling a big brand. So I give them credit. They're developing their own brands, a sort of super brand for all these generic medications. Their yeah. model has worked better than I thought it would, particularly Hims. But having said that, how do they maintain their position? They constantly have to invest in client relationships and in acquiring new customers because there's going to be the guy down the street that sells the same drug at less money, and maybe it's Mark Cuban at cost plus selling that same pill of Viagra or that same finasteride or any other pill at, at that much of a lower price. And so how does HIMS maintain that customer relationship? They've got to invest a lot in that customer. And again, we just believe that was a, a, a business that ultimately would go to a zero gross margin. It hasn't yet, which is surprising to me a bit, but so I give them credit. Having said that, that's not a business we really wanted to be in. To me, that's not a healthcare business. They're creating a brand out of some medications in order to sell to consumers, and consumers like it, and that's a good thing, but that's not the business we wanted to be in. 
And Peter, let me think that through. So I'm contrasting that because they have to keep getting new customers because people are undercutting them with maybe not their branded generic, their house brand, but they're still undercutting them. And people aren't stupid. They can maybe look through the house brand. In your guys' case, how would that differ, that you're more exclusive with some of these brand names? I'm trying to picture the no. difference. No, so so the difference is we're dealing with a brand and medication that that the pharma company sells to the patient. We're not involved in the drug much at all. That's right. We're, it's, it's, it's really, we're providing the health care, we're providing the patient support, but we're not necessarily providing the medication. And that medication is a brand and medication that will not have a competing medication. It might have a competing therapy, but a different drug, but it won't have the same medication that's available in generic because it's branded. So whereas Kim's and Roman are dealing with generic medications that are widely available, and then it's just a question of how much margin you put on the drug to sell to consumers. Now, Hims is combating that a bit by creating some of their own formulations with those branded medications. They're creating a different form factor. For example, they have a Viagra pill that's sort of almost like a piece of gum, and you put it in your mouth, and it's different than a pill. I bet there's a lot of jokes to go along with that if we stopped and thought of them. <laughs> in 2001, when I bought my online pharmacy selling Viagra, boy, oh boy, did I have was the butt of a lot of those jokes. I bet. I'd have to put this into the explicit category then. Contrast what you're doing. So let's say that I see a brand name drug in a magazine or something, and I know now that I can go there and or press a button online or scan a QR code or something like that, and I might be taken to your company. What else might I be going to? What other brand, not by name, but what other things are some of the brand name companies doing? Are some of them actually partnering with a pharmacy and so on. What other business models are there for a brand that I see in a magazine, for example? So there's really been a sea change taking place in pharma. Pharma in the last three, four or five years has started to really think about digital. How do they provide a digital experience for their consumer? And what that has typically meant is not just creating a branded website that gives you lots of different information. That's static. They've had that. But how do they elevate that experience with the consumer? And how do they remain close to the consumer? So what we've seen is a lot of manufacturers have gone out and done requests for proposals for telemedicine support. How do you plug and play a telemedicine company? And if you followed the news for Lilly Direct, they did it at a very grand scale. They announced that they're going to partner with several telemedicine companies and go direct to consumer which has also really instigated a lot of adoption in the industry. So this digital experience has transformed into a telemedicine experience. But what we found is these requests for proposals that go out to market, there's usually 30, 40 companies that might answer and be a part of the proposal. It always comes down to us and maybe one or two other possible solutions. But frankly, no one has the fully integrated solution that we have. And what I mean by that is patient can go online, we create an electronic medical record, we have a healthcare provider providing information to the consumer. We have a patient support team checking on coverage, benefits, analysis for the patient and helping the patient through the consumer flow. And then we're fully integrated from a technology standpoint into many different hubs and many different pharmacy operations. So we have a full closed loop solution for pharmaceutical companies that really, I don't believe anyone else has today. There are different pieces of it people have. Uh, so so what we find is we win nine out of 10 requests for proposals, at least, if not more than that. And out of all the partnerships that launched this year, we'll launch over 30 in 2024. There may be another three or four that are going to get launched by some other methodology. And usually that methodology is partnering with a marketing firm that's going to do a lot of customer acquisition on behalf of the pharma company, in addition to then teaming up with a telemedicine service to plug and play. All right, so let's say I'm a short-sighted CEO of a startup manufacturer of something like that, and I want it all. I want all the profit from this. It seems that I would set up my own, and I know all the reasons why I wouldn't do this, because I believe in specialization and I believe in doing what you do well and all that kind of stuff. But it seems that I would want to set something up to do what you do 
but then I want you closely associated with my brand, more closely associated, and I want my hand in the kitty when I sell that drug. I kind of want to own that too. So I want it more closely associated. Are there companies that try to do that? For example, let's say there's a name brand company. Are there any that are trying to sell it out of their, maybe figuratively, but sell it out of their warehouse instead of getting all these secondary and tertiary markets involved? They, they can't. It, so if what you're describing is a pharmaceutical company going direct to consumer, creating their own healthcare practitioners, for example, owning yes. the entire suite, from a regulatory standpoint, pharma companies cannot be involved in the practice of medicine at all. And there's even an infrastructure that we have to establish as a third party supplier or vendor to pharma. There's a whole infrastructure, complicated infrastructure that we have to maintain to be able to provide that service to pharma companies. But pharma companies legally are not able to provide those services directly. They can't do either the medical part, meaning the prescribing, and they can't do a true direct to consumer from their back warehouse Correct. to the person. Correct. That's interesting. Yeah. So first of all, they can't go direct to consumer with healthcare practitioners because they are not allowed to practice medicine. They're manufacturing a drug. They'd be it'd be a strange set of incentives if they were then had a bunch of physicians prescribing their drugs. Sure, absolutely. We're, we're, which is why, in effect, the Chinese walls for us are so significant, because we have to be sure that our clinicians are not incentivized in any way by what pharma companies pay us to support their program. So that's very carefully managed by our organization and by our lawyers. On the pharma side, pharmaceutical companies can't really go direct to consumer because they'd have to get 50 state licenses. And they'd have to have a pharmacy operation. They'd have to have pharmacy and pharmacists in charge. You know, these are things they would never want to do. I'm not even sure they could do it purely from a regulatory standpoint. When was the, I know you're not a history person necessarily, but was there ever a catch up to that where some of these companies tried to do it and then the laws got stricter? Or do you think none of them really tried because the laws have always kind of been there? I, I, at least what I'm aware of is that these pharma companies have never really been able to do that. You've had durable equipment manufacturer try and go direct to consumer and they've gotten involved in a lot of uh, regulatory problems. So that's a complex relationship. And that's been shut down very quickly by regulators. That'd be like some heart monitor or something like that, that they're trying to have the sales team and the product team and all that kind of wrapped up into one, something like that. Well, I'll give you a, a really recent example. And this is where you've seen the Justice Department come out with some anti-fraud suits. You had you would have a healthcare company create a health fair, invite a bunch of geriatric patients to this health fair, and they would do genetic testing for these geriatric patients. And the geriatric patients don't really know what they're signing up for. They just, sure, would you want to give me a free test for me to learn about my genetics and whether or not my children will be influenced or my grandchildren will be influenced by something in my genetic composition? I'll take that test. Well, the issue is number one, those companies were then applying for Medicare funds to pay for the test. Number two, the patient wasn't having to come out of pocket at all, which is another red flag. And three, these were really unnecessary tests fundamentally. And so if you've seen investigations, I think you've probably seen indictments of companies that started doing genetic testing of groups of people in health fair. I shouldn't have had to look for this example because in my life, I've had a couple of DVTs in my leg and I go to this local group of doctors who their claim to fame is we don't amputate, not for my thing, but I mean for diabetes, we don't amputate. Right. We like to save stuff. I just got a letter. In fact, I, I just got the packet today of my record because they were basically shut down because they were both diagnosing and then doing too much testing with Medicare, which wasn't needed. And I think they might have even... I don't know for sure, but they might have even had like their own products or something that they were using for this or something and just not enough oversight on that. And they closed down, like I say, I got just my transfer packet today out of there. Yeah. Look, this is an area that's fraught with all sorts of regulatory issues. You've got 50 state laws to deal with. You've got federal laws to deal with. You've got Medicare. You've got anti-kickback. You've got corporate practice of medicine. You've got pharmacy laws. You've got physician laws. The amount of investment we made in legal to basically launch our compliant platform 
I mean, it may not go into the tens of millions, but it's certainly in the upper millions of dollars to set this up properly and do it right and maintain it for that matter, because laws are always changing. All right, now, Peter, none of your staff put me up to this, and it always comes out wrong when I ask this, but what do you do all day? Oh, yeah. But as a CEO, I, I know all days are different, but give me an example of what a day might look like yep. for you. Yep. So, Mike, one of the interesting things, I spoke a little bit about our corporate culture, and, and we're really focused on the patient. But because we've created this organization that's just pure integrity, really doing the right thing, leading from the heart as much as we do from the pocket. Literally, we have signs all over our offices with these various slogans, but there are six senior members of management that really run the day-to-day -day operations of the company. Five of them have been there 20 plus years, incredibly loyal, incredibly dedicated, incredibly successful at building really an important platform. And the last one was our chief operating officer we hired three years ago, who is just outstanding, George Jones. And He's made my life a lot easier these days, by the way. The last three years, I've been able to vacation more than I have in the previous 20 years. So that's been quite nice. But look, I wake up in the morning. First of all, I read the press. I spend a lot of time reading various newspapers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. I try and read The Economist. I try and get some articles in The New Yorker as well. But I spend time reading in the morning, and then I answer emails. Is this on your phone or on, uh, online? iPad. or iPad. iPad, yeah. IPad. Yep. And then I head over to my laptop computer. And I answer emails. And I always have some emails that are important. Sometimes they're from pharma companies wanting to talk about things going on in the platform. Frankly, most of those go to the other members of our management team these days and not so much to me. I might get an inquiry from one of our physicians that says, hey, I want to talk to you about something. I have a concern about this or I have a concern about that. But most of my day is really spent on legal, regulatory matters. It's on our financial matters. Are we going to go public someday? Are we going to sell to a strategic uh, partner someday. I'm always talking to bankers. I'm always talking to private equity firms. So that's how a lot of my time is spent and really thinking strategically, where is this business going? I'd say the final hour of my day is always about what are we going to do next? What do we need? Where's the risk in the business? What do we need to improve? How's our user interface? Maybe we need to do a study on that. What's happening with our NPS ratings? What's happening with our trust pilot ratings? Are we doing well? And frankly, I try and have a holistic vision of the business and a strategic vision as best I can, which is really, these days, so many CEOs are caught up in the day-to-day. -day. It's really difficult to do that, but I've got such an awesome management team that I get to do the good stuff. And then are you on the phone for these conversations? Are you on face-to-face -face or video? What are you doing for all these conversations you mentioned? So that's a really interesting question. I really dislike the phone. I can be so much more efficient in emails, and I can be so much more efficient in, in texting, and and I can set things straight and be factual. I love the Zoom calls. I mean, I like the personal interaction, but my day would be unproductive if I was on Zoom calls all day. Cause, and every once in a while, I am on Zoom calls all day. So with our pharma partners, after we launch their site, we have regular meetings. Either they'll generally start out every single week, They'll move to a cadence of about once a month, and they rarely move to a cadence of anything extended more than once a month. But we get on the phone with them. Every once in a while, I'll sit on some of those calls. But I can't spend my day on those calls. I need to be responsive. And so I, I find email is highly effective for me. So your conversations with them are typically email conversations. Correct. And then every once in a while, there'll be a Zoom call. That's rare. I love email. I sound antiquated, like it just got invented yesterday, but it's a track record. You can go back and look at your conversation, get caught up on it. Yeah. It's passive interruptions. You can read it at six at night. Someone else can read it on the other side of the world at six at night, their time. I mean, it's a really good way to go. And when people say they want to talk to me, I'm like, I don't talk to you. And I typically don't. Yeah. And Look, I find that email on a personal level, sometimes it's hard to have the right intonation about something, but on a professional level, you're right. You create a permanent record. I can go back and look and say, oh yeah, this is the conversation I had last time. Let's be sure I'm sympathetic to what was said then and, and let's take the conversation another step further. And it kind of avoids like the old lady purse. There's a lot of old lady purse stuff that is done by 40-year-old corporate guys, it's just in a different 
style. It's yeah. five minutes shooting the breeze on the sports, and it, it's fine, but it doesn't make for a real tight day. Then you can break off of that and spend time with your family and so on. And hey, Mike, I'm not a chit chat guy. I probably spent too many years on Wall Street for that. I really just want to get to the heart of the matter. And if I want to chit chat, I'll chit chat with friends, relatives, my wife. I, I really don't want to chit chat. I just want to get the business done. I once heard that, I guess I practice this. They said, don't put up a bunch of pictures around your office at work of your family and that kind of stuff. It's just get in there, get it done and go spend time with them. Yeah. If you have pictures of them there, you're not with them enough. You're spending yeah. too much time at the office. Yeah, that's probably right. That's Although I'm guilty of having lots of pictures of my kids all the way all around. But yeah. Well, yeah. I just don't do it because I'm lazy. We're in our house now. We've been here for 20 years and I'm still thinking about putting a picture up in the bathroom someday or something like that. Don't take me as a guide for that. Peter, what's the worst hour or two of your week? Is there such a thing? In the early days of this business, we faced existential risk every day. We were worried about a regulatory silver bullet. So when a regulator sent me an email, oh my gosh, my heart would pound. If a regulator ever called, one time, I won't name the state, but you can probably guess who it is, but a state sends me a fine for $100 million by fax. By fax for $100 by million. Fax, dollars. By fax. They said, we think you've done this many prescriptions in our state. We don't agree with the way you've done your prescriptions, blah, blah, blah. $100 million fine. And this was one of many crazy regulatory incidents. We, of course, negotiated out of it, and it was nonsensical, and they didn't understand something. But I think we gave them $5,000 to go away. So it's moments like that over the years that were really hard. Today, if I get a bad call or a bad email, it's going to be patient-related. It's going to be, I've had an unsatisfactory experience. Your customer service person was, or your patient support person was abrupt with me. My doctor didn't show up on time. We're not perfect. So sometimes our doctors don't make their appointments online or we miss something. Those are the moments I hate because I just want everyone to have a phenomenal experience with our platform. Boy, there's some stuff you read the books about offloading this or that. And there's some stuff I just kind of like to do. Like at my house, I've got a riding lawnmower. And that was a time where I would just kind of do it because I enjoyed the noise and the peacefulness of it and so on and the hum of the engine and that. But no longer, Peter, I've got a cottage 30, 40 minutes away. And this spring, I said, I'm never going to cut this damn lawn again. And so I looked into riding mowers and things like that. And I ended up getting a lawn robot. Oh, wow. Roomba I've seen for the things. lawn. Yeah. yeah. Today, it's the first day of 90 degree weather in Grand Rapids. We're going to have a stretch of that. So I was at work and I started this thing up remotely. And there was such pleasure knowing that something was getting done, but I wasn't sweating to do it. Right. Right. How beautiful is that? So does that Roomba really work? It works great. Oh, that's fabulous. That's beautiful. I wanted to wait till there was GPS on it because I didn't want to put down the lines and all that kind of stuff. Right. It's fascinating. It knows exactly where it's going, and so it knows if it missed this spot over here, it goes back and gets it and things like that. It's great when technology takes over tasks you don't want to do. And then we have geese at the lake, and so I've bought a decoy coyote. I'm kind of a big deal on the lake this year with my fake coyote in my room, but I've got people stopping and stuff like that. And you don't need a big boat to do that or a nice new pontoon. Right. It's just a little yard Roomba and, and the coyote. You're the celebrity. This is up in Michigan, upper Michigan? Yeah, we're in Michigan. If you put your left hand up, Grand Rapids is about a halfway up your hand, kind of in about an inch in. And then, okay. so that's about where we are. And our cottage is just a little bit north of there. Now, Peter, you were saying that you spent a lot of time in New York, but now you're in Arizona. What's the difference? Is it just heat related or is it still business related of why you do some of these things? Uh, it's largely business related in the sense that if we have a number of meetings that are going to happen in New Jersey with our fire partners or in New York City, I, I'm going to be here for an extended period. I, I kind of try and push them together as much as I can. Uh, it's not so much weather related, honestly, but it's also sort of uh, family related uh, because my children are here in New York City. And so I, I sometimes want to be around, like for Father's Day, it was great to be here this past weekend. I'm in New York now. 
but I probably won't head back to Arizona for a few months just because it's so hot there right now until it cools off a little bit. But, you know, our offices in Scottsdale, that's corporate headquarters, we are largely a virtual company in the sense that we have 30, 40 tech people that almost never come into the office. We have people that live in Washington, we have people that live in Montana, we have people that live in Ohio, on and on. So they're almost never around. Our patient support people are around. They show up to the office. The executives show up to the office, most of them, not all of them. Some of them kind of work. With, for example, our chief operating officer lives in New Jersey. He commutes to the office. Every third week, he's in the office for a week. I try and time it so I'm in the office when he's there if I can. But I've got a complicated schedule because I travel quite a bit. You know, I'm always sort of going to some other meeting somewhere. Are you ever going to those meetings as just the face of the business to show how important an account or something is? Because like you said, you've got so much support that's doing such a good job. I, I can't imagine you're, yeah. I got to be careful how I say this. I can't imagine you're needed there, but right. I, I can see your face needing to be there sometimes. Yeah, th that's right. I don't have to be involved from the standpoint of supporting our partners. They really don't need me at all. I have to be involved if our partner needs to feel that we're supporting them. So every once in a while, I'll have to show up for that purpose. And I'm delighted to. And I like knowing our partners and what they're thinking and saying. So it's a good opportunity for me, too. But our team is so crackerjack. They don't need me. I know they don't need me. But I want to be there when I need to be there. And I always will be with it when I need to be there. So I'll get on a plane in a minute if I have to. Peter, I know you mentioned something private versus public and so on. Is that in the works? Are you guys happy where you are? What's the future as far as ownership and so on? So we are so fortunate in that I was able to fund the company initially, and we really have not taken in much capital at all over the last 20 years. Our stock is only 5% owned by outside third parties. And so the management team and I own the rest of the company, and we will decide what to do. We all are energetic and want to keep going and want to keep growing it. Business is literally exploding the demand for our services. And so we want to keep that going and do it as long as we can. And we'll probably look to bring in a partner. If we think that partners can really help us in growing, we'll look to bring in partners, perhaps some strategic partners in the next year or so. We might look at a public offering. There's some banks that want to talk to us about a public offering next year. I don't know that we'd really do that or not. But we feel really good about where we are at the moment, and we just want to keep growing, keep doing better and better at what we are good at, which is running the business, and stay focused. But I meet with private equity firms and bankers all the time. What would be the reason to, let's say you don't need the influx of capital, would there ever be a reason to bring in a partner to grow or something that you just couldn't hire? You need to actually bring them in because... That's the only way they can do their thing. Or could you hire that stuff too? I think there's different reasons why you bring in different types of capital into a company. And one of the reasons is sometimes you want some discipline. You want financial discipline. Or another is you want some strategic value. So we don't feel like we need the financial discipline. We're pretty good at running the company and maintaining the financial wherewithal. We do believe that Partners that are potentially really knowledgeable of pharma and opportunities to not circumvent PBMs, but kind of evolve the model for healthcare, evolve the model for online medicine to the extent there's partners that can play a role with that. Perhaps they provide some hub services that we don't offer. So it might make sense to bring in a hub partner. It might make sense to bring in some financial partners who just could help us decide what to do in terms of our major financing that'll come up in the next year or so. But really it's knowledge focused, it's expertise. And can you hire that? You can hire some of it, sometimes not. Sometimes you get it from a board of directors. It just depends on who you have, who you surround yourself with and what you're doing. Uh, we've not ever focused on creating a real significant board of directors. I, I think I know some people I would add when we do decide to do that. But I don't want to do that until we really are taking in more outside capital and have more responsibility to shareholders. In my little operation, my grandpa first and then my dad. My dad always said we run best as a benevolent dictatorship. So with both of them passed on, I'm the benevolent dictator now. That's a family of entrepreneurs. I have a bunch of 
siblings, but that wouldn't have worked. It works just best with one of us. The decisions. I wouldn't have gone that route. So you got to be real careful about who you bring in and why and what power you want to give away and all that. Decisions are easy right now. They're really easy. I just make the decision. My team will give me all sorts of options and ideas and thoughts, and we'll say, here's what we're going to do, guys. And that's where we head. I spent a few years on this parochial school board. We'd be talking about something for three meetings in a row, three months in a row, and then the priest would show up to the board meeting, and you'd say this, and they'd say, no. And I learned real quickly that we were just a recommending board, and that's all we were. That's beautiful. Oh, yeah. My dad, I would have ideas, and usually things would go my way. He passed on 20 years ago. We'd worked together for about 10 years. Usually things would go my way, but it was just like, and it's probably as good practice in, in setting up my arguments and stuff that I now can use in my head by myself. But the things were just drawn out because you knew what something was a good idea, but you had to articulate it. And that just took a long time. And so yeah. it was probably good for the business overall, but it just seemed to take a long time instead of just a streamlined approach. So, you know, it's interesting. I'm a, uh, a leader that I really look for the input from everyone around me. I really do. And I want to hear what they have to say. I want to hear the way they're thinking about something. And then I want to tell them, guys, here's what I think we do. And then I want to hear the criticisms of it. What am I missing? What am I not seeing? I constantly ask that question. What am I not seeing? Help me to understand your view. And I want you to have a different view. We recently had a strategic meeting of our top 15 leaders in the company, and we're sitting around the boardroom table, and someone needed my view on something. And I said, well, let's go around this table. I want everyone else to give their view, and then I'll give you my view. And it's a great exercise because, first of all, you're engaging everyone in your organization to have an opinion and, and, and encouraging them to have an opinion and have a view and think about things. And and then besides just encouraging them to do that, they may have a great idea that you haven't really thought about. And then it also adds this culture of we are a team. We're all in this together. And so I mentioned that our senior team has been with me 20 plus years. The average longevity of our everyday employee is probably more than a decade. We don't lose people because they quit. We lose people because they haven't kept up with us or they didn't rise to the occasion. And that's even that's rare because we give people a lot of chances to really shine. When I became an entrepreneur from becoming a Wall Street investment banker, I really wanted to create a unique business environment that focused on people first. That people meaning our clients, our patients, our healthcare providers, our pharmacists, our tech team, our patient support team, our executive. I wanted to focus on all these other constituencies besides just bottom line dollars, besides just creating another valuable enterprise. I really wanted to do something unique, and I think we've been really successful at it. And a part of it's been by engaging with our employees and asking them to play a role actively in the organization. Stealing a couple of things from Bezos, I think, the part about listening, and I think on purpose, I don't know if it was their company or not, Amazon or not, but they said that they always have the new people speak first because typically they're just going to nod, especially if the leader says something, yep. and then he speaks last. I think Bezos was saying that he'll come out and say, look, I don't agree with you. I don't think that's going to work, but I want to do it. You have my full support. Yeah, and if you treat somebody around that table, if you say to them, bad idea, we're not doing that, and, and shut them off that quickly, no one else at that table is going to respect them and be able to work with them properly. You have to show That's them interesting. Respect. That's interesting. You're saying they won't have respect for that person either because they're kind of following you. Right. Exactly. I've got to set a tone that respects everyone's opinion. I think it's listed in our conference room as one of the things we do is we respect each other's opinions. So when I was young, let's say what a strange little kid I was, I, I read a book by Mortimer Adler, who at the time was the editor-in-chief of the dictionary. I think it was Merriweather Dictionary, if I remember. I'm, I'm probably getting that name wrong. But- Morton Radler wrote a book called How to Think, How to Listen. And I was a young boy when I read this, but it talked about how in school you learn all about writing. You learn all about math. You don't learn how to listen. Don't learn how to just shut up and listen. And that book has served me well throughout my life. It's just don't say anything, just listen. This goes along with the board stuff. One of my teenage daughters, and I only have two teenage daughters left, but 
she was giving advice to my wife. My wife was saying, I got to stop eating this and I've got to do this and exercise this and that. She said, mom, she said, I don't like that negative talk that you're giving to yourself. And so later that night, she gives this list to my wife and it's got 10 things of like self, what would it be, like self-appreciation. I forget the term. I'm good enough. I'm strong enough. Affirmation. Reinforcement. Positive affirmations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's got this list one through 10. I'm a good person. I do take care of myself. I love myself and all this kind of stuff. So Margaret showed me that later and I turned it over and I'm like, where the hell is 11 to 20 where it says you're the worst mom in the world and you never listen to me? None of my friends' moms do this? That's beautiful. Peter, tell our listeners again how they're going to find your company, find you, and so on. So Upscript Health is the name of the company. You can go to upscripthealth.com. And if you went to upscript.com, you would see the various medications that we provide for, for our manufacturing partners. It's a subset of them. Mm -hmm. Or... The way you'll really find us more often than not is you'll see an advertisement for a medication. You'll go online to that website to, to do some research about that medication, and there'll be a button that says, would you like to speak to an Upscript Health provider right now? And you'll click on that button, and you'll be on our pro platform. Well, golly, Peter, thanks for joining us. That was delightful. It was fun talking to you and just seeing all the ins and outs of that. Really cool. I know you're a busy guy. you got a lot going on, so I appreciate you spending time with us. Mike, and I appreciate you taking time and having me on your broadcast. Thank you very much. I'm really honored. Thank you, Peter. We'll be in touch. Great. Thanks, Mike. You've been listening to the Business of Pharmacy podcast with me, your host, Mike Kelzer. Please subscribe for all future episodes.